Hello to chapter 29 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled Enter Ahab to Him Stub. Some days elapsed, and ice and icebergs all astern, the peacock now went rolling through the bright Quito spring, which at sea almost perpetually reigns on the threshold of the eternal August of the tropic. The warmly cool, clear, ringing perfumed, overflowing, redundant days were as crystal goblets of Persian sherbet, heaped up, flanked up with rose-water snow. The start and stately knights seemed haughty dames in jeweled velvets, nursing at home in lonely pride the memory of their absent conquering earls, the golden-helmeted sons. For sleeping man, t'was hard to choose between such winsome days and such seducing nights, but all the witcheries of that unwaning weather did not merely lend new spells and potencies to the outward world. Inward they turned upon the soul, especially when the still mild hours of eve came on, then memory shot her crystals as the clear ice most forms of noiseless twilights, and all these subtle agencies more and more they wrought on Ahab's texture. Old age is always wakeful, as if the longer linked with life, the less man has to do with aught that looks like death. Among sea commanders, the old greybeards will oftenest leave their berths to visit the night-cloaked deck. It was so with Ahab, only that now, of late, he seemed so much to live in the open air that, truly speaking, his visits were more to the cabin than from the cabin to the planks. It feels like going down into one's tomb he would mutter to himself, for an old captain like me to be descending this narrow scuttle to go to my grave duck berth. So almost every twenty-four hours when the watches of the night were set and the band on deck sentineled the slumber of the band below, and when, if a rope was to be hauled upon the forecastle, the sailors flung it not rudely down, as by day, but with some cautiousness dropped it to its place for fear of disturbing their slumbering shipmates. When this sort of steady quietude would begin to prevail, habitually the silent steersman would watch the cabin scuttle, and ere long the old man would emerge, gripping at the iron banister to help his crippled way. Some considering touch of humanity was in him, for at times like these he usually abstained from patrolling the quarter-deck because to his wearied mates seeking repose within six inches of his ivory heel such would have been the reverberating crack and din of that bony step that their dreams would have been of the crunching teeth of sharks. But once the mood was on him to deep, for common regardings, and as with heavy, lumber-like pace he was measuring the ship from taffrail to mainmast, stop, the old second mate came up from below and with a certain unassured deprecating humorousness hinted that one could, that no one could say nay. Now, that if Captain Ahab was pleased to walk the planks, then no one could say nay, but there might be some way of muffling the noise, hinting something indistinctly and hesitatingly about a globe of toe and the insertion into it of the ivory heel. Ah, stop, thou didst not know Ahab, then. Am I a cannonball, Stub? said Ahab, that thou wouldst ward me that fashion? But go thy ways, I had forgot, below to thy nightly grave, where such as ye sleep between shrouds to use ye to the filling one at last, down dog and kennel. 
starting at the unforeseen concluding exclamation of the so suddenly scornful old man, Stubb was speechless a moment, then said excitedly, I'm not used to be spoken to that way, sir. I do but less than half like it, sir. A vast gritted Ahab between his set teeth and violently moving away as if to avoid some passion or temptation. No, sir, not yet, said Stubb, emboldened. I will not tamely be called a dog, sir. Then be called ten times a donkey and a mule and an ass and be gone or I'll clear the world of thee. As he said this, Ahab advanced upon him with such overbearing terrors in his aspect that Stubb involuntarily retreated. I was never served so before without giving a hard blow for it, muttered Stubb as he found himself descending the cabin scuttle. It's very queer. Stop, stop, somehow. Now, I don't know. I don't well know whether to go back and strike him or... What's that? Down here on my knees and pray for him? Yes. That was the thought coming up in me. But it would be the first time I ever did pray. It's queer. Very queer. And he's queer too. I take him fore and aft. He's about the queerest old man stop ever sailed with. Hell, how he flashed at me, his eyes like powder pans. Is he mad? <laughs> a anyways, there's some things on his mind as sure as there must be something on a deck when it cracks. He ain't in his bed now, either more than three hours out of the twenty-four. And he don't sleep then. Didn't that dough boy, the steward, tell me that of a morning he always finds the old man's hammock clothes all rumpled and tumpled, and the sheets down at the foot, and the coverlet almost tied into knots, and the pillow a sort of frightful hot, as if though a baked brick had been on it. A hot old man. I guess he's got what some folks ashore call a conscience. It's a kind of tig-dolly row, they say. Worse, nor a toothache. Well, well, I don't know what it is, but the Lord keep me from catching it. He's full of riddles. I wonder what he goes into the afterhold for. Every night a doughboy tells me he suspects what's that for. I should like to know. Who's made an appointment with him in the hold? Ain't that queer now? But there's no telling. It's the old game. Here, go, he, here goes for a snooze, damn me. It's worth a fellow's while to be born into the world, if only to fall right asleep. And now that I think of it, that's about the first thing babies do. And that's a sort of queer too. Damn me. But all things are queer, come to think of them. But that's again my principles. Think not. It's my eleventh commandment. And sleep when you can is my twelfth. So... Here goes again. But how's that? Didn't he call me a dog? Blazes, he called me ten times a donkey and piled a lot of jackasses on top of that. He might as well have kicked me and done with it. Maybe he did kick me and I didn't observe it. I was so taken all aback with his brow somehow. It flashed like a bleached bone. What the devil's the matter with me? I don't stand right on my legs. Coming afoul of that old man has a sort of turned me wrong side out. By the Lord, I must have been dreaming, though. How, how, how? But the only way is to stash it. So, here goes to hammock again, and in the morning I'll see how this plaguey juggly thinks over by daylight. So that was chapter 29. Bye-bye till next time with chapter 30, which is titled The Pipe.